Hello, everybody. Great to be here. Um, and thank you so much, Liz, for that introduction. I'd like to start by offering a fulsome thank you to Radcliffe, the Radcliffe Institute, uh, to the Grayson family uh, for having me here as a fellow, along with such uh, other um, amazing people that I've had a chance to, to listen to and learn from. Um, I was incredibly privileged to get to serve in the Obama administration for eight years, but one of the disadvantages of being in national security 24-7 is it tends to narrow your perspective. And um, coming here and learning about facial recognition technology and pirates and cichlid fish um, it may, reminds me and, and affirms for me why it's so amazing to be on a campus, and especially this amazing campus. So thank you. Um, and I also just, you know, it's wonderful to see so many people here today. You could be doing a lot of different things, so thank you for coming out. Um, I have spent my time thus far, I can't believe it's slipping away, but uh, trying to understand the journey that, that Liz described, um, a journey that took me from being initially a journalist um, and activist and academic uh, into the messy world of politics and uh, specifically into Barack Obama's Senate uh, office, into his presidential campaign, which I had to leave uh, briefly, um, and finally into the White House, and um, most amazingly, as his ambassador to the United Nations in his second term. Um, in coming here today and having the chance to speak at Harvard for the first time since I've returned and to do my make my Radcliffe presentation, I considered a lot of different topics within the broad rubric of foreign policy from the inside out, because um, I'm exploring a very broad range of topics. And I thought, you know, the, the question I get asked the most about, which may come up in the discussion period, is the, the red line in Syria. There's a lot to say about the person currently occupying the Oval Office and the future of the liberal international order. I could have gone in that direction. But given the broader reckoning going on in our country and around the world, I thought I would actually uh, use this occasion here at Radcliffe, of all places, to reflect on a question that I increasingly get, which is, what was it like as a woman doing foreign policy in the US government and at the UN? Um, and I stress, because I, I am a professor here, but this is not an academic lecture, uh, it's not my normal kind of analytic fair. It is one person's personal experiences from which I try to draw also uh, some lessons um, regarding how we go forward in the face of many of the challenges uh, that are being discussed and aired, uh, but uh, many of which are not yet being uh, addressed. Um, so let me start a little bit at the beginning. Um, before I began working in the US government, I will admit that I had never been all that self-conscious about being a woman in the workplace. And this is partly because I was raised um, by a very single-minded Irish mother, Vera Delaney, who overcame such severe hurdles uh, and prejudices herself to do what she loved, which was to practice medicine, um, that I compared my lucky life, uh, which was very privileged, certainly, in comparison to some of the challenges she faced. Not long after, this is her, this is me and my mother, uh, she, yeah, I know, she's great. Um, she's really great. Um, but not long after she married uh, my father and had me, my mother became a doctor at a time when married women made up uh, less than 10% of the Irish workforce. I grew up on stories of her experiences uh, in the medical profession and in the, in the world, which often weren't pretty, but they never deterred her. She was full speed ahead. Like the one when she tried to acquire custody of my younger brother and me so she could bring us to the United States in order to be able to deepen her training as a, as a kidney doctor. And in the courtroom, the justice mused out loud about my mother, who at that point had a PhD in biochemistry and a medical degree. What right has this woman to be so educated? <laughs> I know. But these are the kinds of stories I grew up on. So I thought, you know. Uh, who's got problems? My first real job 
uh, was as a 23-year-old war correspondent in the Balkans. Now, of course, it was um, men, mainly, who orchestrated and fought the wars that I was covering. Interestingly, though, among the posse of freelancers um, and full-time uh, correspondents who gravitated to the Balkans, um, it was women war correspondents who really, at that time, I think, stood out. Everyone from Christiane Amanpour of CNN, of course, to Maggie O'Kane of The Guardian, who uncovered concentration camps in northern Bosnia, Kate Aidy of the BBC, Carol Williams of the LA Times. These were amazing role models for me and my uh, girlfriends, who are still my, my closest friends, um, uh, to have at, at, that, at that stage. And although the culture that we encountered in the Balkans was patriarchal in, uh, in the extreme, although not compared to what some of our people here I know have gone through, but with very deep-rooted sexism, uh, writing for the Western media in Bosnia in the 1990s was a, a far cry for women from what Martha Gellhorn had gone through to try to cover the D-Day invasion in World War II. Some of you know the story where she had to hide in the toilet of a hospital ship and to sneak ashore with an ambulance crew in order to cover uh, the landing. I can't be scientific um, about the difference that gender made uh, in Bosnia. And it is even conceivable that we women correspondents, of whom there were many, actually enjoyed better access to the people and events we wished to cover because the local gunmen so underestimated us. Um, but that said, I also don't know a single woman colleague who wasn't at one point caught off guard by a romantic come on from a source or left stammering her way out of uh, an unexpected uh, advance. I must admit, again, that I had not reflected much on the role that gender played in my career at all, really, until recently when hundreds um, of brave women and a few men began coming forward to share their personal experiences uh, of harassment, predation, assault, exposing decades of toxic and illegal behavior uh, by people in positions of power. Like everything in this age, in this age, I should say, it has a hashtag, hashtag me too. Um, but unlike so many other issues that have burst into the news and then just as quickly disappeared, hashtag Me Too has become more impactful on the national and the global conversation than I think any of us could have imagined when we first read uh, about Harvey Weinstein, for example, last fall. These silence breakers, as Time Magazine called its 2017 Person of the Year, have jump-started a uh, long overdue reckoning. It is reaching across professions and party lines, shining a light on the invisible daily struggles endured for too long by our mentors, our teachers, friends, colleagues, neighbors, grandmothers, mothers, and even our own daughters. It is no wonder, then, that this reckoning has also reached the field of national security and foreign policy. Two months ago, in November, 223 women who work in or on US national security, including many close colleagues of mine from the Obama administration, signed an open letter that they titled hashtag Me Too NatSec. You don't have to read the letter. I do recommend uh, looking for it online, but that's just to give you a hint of the letter. Uh, the letter is addressed to the entire national security community, and it was quite measured in tone. It made no sensational claims about specific abusers, nor did it call out any particular government agency, declaring, quote, we too are survivors of sexual harassment, assault, and abuse, or know others who are, end quote. Ambassadors, professors, diplomats, intelligence analysts, military officers, think tankers, and leading experts from every part of the foreign policy community delivered a stinging assessment. I'll just read you part of the letter. Many women are held back or driven from the national security field by men who use their power to assault at one end of the spectrum and perpetuate, sometimes unconsciously, environments that silence, demean, belittle, or neglect women at the other. Assault is the progression of the same behaviors that permit us to be denigrated, interrupted, shut out, <laughs> excuse me, shut out, and shut up. These behaviors incubate a permissive environment where sexual harassment and assault 
take hold. So that's just a part of the letter. So this letter only received fleeting media coverage, but it did uh, generate significant attention in the foreign policy world. And among those reacting were the 10 Democrats on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee who forwarded this letter to Secretary of State Rex Tillerson with a warning that a failure to remedy the problems it described would have what, what uh, the senators called a deep and negative effect on US national security. Well beyond the letter, in recent months, again, a little beneath the radar compared to some of what's in the press each day, women in national security have come forward to share their experiences of indignities and abuses, large and small, themselves overcoming or con combating, overriding the longstanding concern that speaking out would torpedo their careers. I'll offer just two stark examples. One widely shared frustration is the demeaning, often flippant attitude uh, men in the national security realm have expressed toward the professional advancement or achievement of their female colleagues. Heather Hurlbert, who's a former speechwriter in the White House and the State Department, recalled being hired for her dream job only to be told by her boss, quote, we held this job open for a woman, so I hired you and dated the other finalist, end quote. <laughs> Not ideal. Others have spoken to the dangerous culture of entitlement and impunity that prevails in a profession that entails often long foreign trips and long uh, hours. Rosa Brooks, some of you may have seen this, a defense official in the Obama administration, described a harrowing experience from earlier in her career with a senior foreign service officer who, as she put it, quote, grabbed me and shoved his tongue forcibly down my throat as we walked along a deserted canal in Venice Returning from an international law conference, it took several minutes of skirmishing and several firm threats to shove him into the canal before he stopped pawing at me, end quote. Now this problem is obviously widespread well beyond the national security community, as we, we all know, and, and certainly well beyond the United States. Just last week, in fact, The Guardian published a devastating expose describing pervasive sexual harassment, assault, and retaliation across the UN often perpetrated by senior officials. A former investigator for the UN's Internal Affairs Division told the paper that he routinely witnessed cover-ups cover and that impunity for offenders was the norm. As he put it, the only rule is not to publicly embarrass the organization. Capital O, organization. Um, taking stock of the many experiences shared by female national security professionals, the political scientist Dan Dresner described women in this field as facing what he called a gender tax, uh, something that our male counterparts um, don't shoulder. Speaking more personally, I think it is fair to say that the first time I began to focus on what it meant to be a woman in the workplace was when I started to work in Washington. And let me be clear, on that score and on many others, I feel extremely fortunate to have worked for President Obama the son of a trailblazing mother, the husband of a woman who was once his boss, and the dedicated father of two daughters who has said proudly, it's important that their dad is a feminist because now that's what they expect of men. Um, in his eight years as president, you miss him, don't you? I know, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Obama appointed the highest number of women to cabinet level positions in US history. And I must say, and this mattered to me a lot, he, he always gave the impression that he wasn't scurrying around with women in binders or whatever it was, you know, that we, we heard about one, you know, that, that someone had to make this huge effort in order to find talented women. He, he projected the sense that he was hiring the people who, who were the best for the job, uh, who happened to be women. Nonetheless, in 2009, while women ran key government agencies at the White House itself, where I would work for four years, men held two-thirds of the top jobs. And this wasn't a new phenomenon. It was not until the Eisenhower administration in 1953 that women began to work in the West Wing as more than secretaries. The culture at the White House bore similarities to office dynamics across this great country. Lots of sports metaphors and sports outings to play basketball or golf. Ample dude references and lots and lots of swearing. 
I was fortunate to play basketball, so I had opportunities to do business with senior officials outside of our long hours in the office. I won't speak to the swearing part. Um, the most vivid occasion on which gender dynamics at the White House surfaced publicly came in December 2012 during negotiations over the so-called fiscal cliff, when the White House released a photo of President Obama seated in the Oval Office, uh-oh, with his back to the camera, giving direction to his political, economics, and communications teams. As such, when critics pounced on this photo, someone released this photo, someone very senior would have released this photo, not thinking that there was anything weird about this photo, so we start with that. So when critics saw the photo, the White House pointed out something even worse than releasing the photo itself. Some of you may remember, does anybody remember? That in fact, if you look closely, you will see behind Dan Pfeiffer in his brown corduroys and blue shirt, Valerie Jarrett's leg. <laughs> she was there all along. And literally, you had statements, people on and off the record coming out saying, no, 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 it's fine. Look, there's her knee. You could just see in the black. Anyway. Um, so you can imagine the reaction to this. Jody Cantor of the New York Times tweeted, Jarrett's leg as metaphor. Um, now President Obama, the enlightened guy that he is, of course invited senior women on the White House staff to his office or he had dinners with them so that they could vent, share frustrations, get a sense of you know, what could be done differently. Um, and you know, I think that more self-awareness and deliberateness meant that Women were called on more often, sometimes even when they weren't raising their hands, which happens not only at Harvard campus, but uh, within the White House as well, and also affirming the work of, of his women advisors. But I think, as we all know, numbers matter. And it, it was significant that in the second term, President Obama and his um, very activist chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, went out of their way to try to ensure that women occupied an equal share of the top White House staff jobs. And in fact, in 2015, the White House released a not so subtle photo of the president conferring with his advisors. <laughs> you guys, yes. <laughs> so, and Obama's photographer, Pete Souza, later commented, this is a full frame picture. I guess you'd say I was trying to make a point. <laughs> so at the National Security Council, which is where I worked, it was part of the White House, but its own world, um, in the early years, um, of the Obama administration, men held all the top jobs. National Security Advisor, Deputy National Security Advisor, Homeland Security Advisor, uh, Chief of Staff, Strategic Communications Advisor, and Speechwriter. Uh, the senior staff uh, were known as, are known, I think, maybe that's one thing that's still intact, uh, are still known perhaps as senior directors, NSC senior directors. And my first year, I was one of six women, women who were senior directors out of 26. It gives you some sense of the ratio. One Wednesday, toward the end of our first year, one of my, uh, my senior women colleagues, who was a fellow senior director, invited me and a few other women to come to her office for a glass of wine. This quick break turned into a 90-minute release. And after a half an hour together, each of us called back to our assistants to ask apologetically if they could move our next appointments owing to urgent national security business. <laughs> um, we discussed not only our experience of work at the NSC and some of our frustrations, but also what we were working on, what we were proud of, what we hoped to achieve. Um, this first pretty spontaneous invitation turned into a sacred weekly Wednesday group. Those of us with kids, talked about the chaos of our juggling. The single women among us talked about their latest crushes. Each of us gave each other a quality of attention that was too often lacking in the transactional world of Washington. And outside of these gatherings, I think a change crept into the way that we uh, acted in our larger policy discussions. Without ever discussing it or making any conscious shift at least that I'm aware of, we reflexively supported one another in meetings. Now, this didn't mean we agreed with one another. Um, some of my most uh, spirited arguments at the NSC uh, were with my fellow women senior directors. We were not always on the same page by any means. But we engaged one another's arguments, 
not simply leaving them hanging in the air, uh, which happened too often in larger group discussions. As we compared notes during what became known again as this the Wednesday group, I was struck both by how self-conscious my colleagues were as women role models to younger women, and by the lengths to which these women, the senior directors, went to seek out and hire young women to work directly under them as directors. And I just have to stress how challenging this is to do in the world of foreign policy and national security. You really have to fight gravity um, in order to have the kind of equality of representation that we seek. And why is that? Um, the pipeline, the so-called pipeline of, of women eligible to go into senior foreign policy positions in government is very skewed. Um, in academia, a key feeder to these top national security jobs, the ratio of men to women professors who focus on US foreign policy, back when I was in the Obama, starting in the Obama administration, was three to one. Of the top 10 American think tanks concentrating on international affairs, just one was then run by a woman. When CNN, Fox, and MSNBC, so the range, had foreign policy segments, they chose male commentators a remarkable 80% of the time. And so even though in recent memory, Madeleine Albright, Condoleezza Rice, Hillary Clinton have run the State Department, we can't forget that until 1971, women foreign service officers at state had to retire if they got married. And only 9% of US ambassadors have been women since, the country's, since our country's founding. More often than not, and this remains true today, the women ambassadors are posted to countries considered less central to US national security. No woman has yet served as ambassador, US ambassador to China, to Russia, Israel, Turkey, or Afghanistan. And I think it's fair to say the same basic story applies uh, across government agencies like CIA and, and the Defense Department. I came to understand that hiring men and women in roughly equal numbers at the NSC really required pushing water uphill, slowing down the hiring process at just the time that, given the workload, you, you're inclined to speed it up, and proactively reaching out to women to urge them to throw their, their hats in the ring or trying to appeal to them and, and to overcome the doubts that they have uh, about even taking jobs of this nature, given some of the reputational issues that also existed. Uh, Jim Clapper, President Obama's director of national intelligence, made the case for more proactive hiring uh, this way. He said, over my 53 plus years in the intelligence business, that's a lot of years, I've watched women rise to leadership positions all around me. And having women in leadership roles is more critical than people on the outside would think. We have found that with almost all the major intelligence failures we've had, diversity of thought might have saved us." End quote. And speaking about the equally troubling absence of people of color in the field of national security or foreign policy, President Obama's national security advisor, Susan Rice, put it perfectly, our national security agencies have not yet drawn fully on the strengths of our great nation. In the halls of power, in the faces of our national security leaders, America is still not fully reflected. And that was before the cabinet came to look like founding fathers. Um, <laughs> so fortunately for me, uh, even though there were far more men than women uh, at the NSC, as I've indicated, I rarely found myself the only woman in the room, and there were all, again, all these ways in which I think we found a way to reinforce one another, and, and the culture did evolve, uh, importantly, over time. Things were very different when I got um, to the United Nations, when I became President Obama's second ambassador to the United Nations, where you really often were the only uh, woman in the room. So since World War II, when the UN was created, enshrining within its founding charter the critical importance of human rights and fundamental freedoms, there has never been a woman secretary general. And the percentage of women ambassadors representing the various member states, which and this would just reflect the dynamics within the countries that comprise the UN, has never exceeded 25%. Now, I was really lucky because I didn't represent any old country at the UN. I represented the United States, the country that hosts the UN on its soil. We are the largest financial donor uh, to the UN by leaps and bounds. We have the veto, one of five countries at the UN have the veto. We, take, we bring our policy initiatives there. Um, as a result, I think it's fair to say that over my time at the UN, 
the salience of my Americanness was more uh, relevant or evident uh, to other countries um, than me being a woman was. And so I, I think I suffered very few of the kinds of slights that I know from my colleagues, women colleagues, that they suffered. Madeleine Albright liked to joke, quote, it used to be that the only way a woman could truly make her foreign policy views felt was by marrying a diplomat and then pouring tea on an offending ambassador's lap. <laughs> um, by the time I assumed my position in 2013, a trio of amazingly strong women had served at the UN representing the United States before me. Jean Kirkpatrick, 1981 to 1985, Albright herself, 93 to 97, before she became our first woman Secretary of State, and Ambassador Rice, 2009 to 2013. So when I got to New York, I read the biographies uh, by Jean Kirkpatrick and about Jean Kirkpatrick and uh, by uh, Secretary Albright herself. And I think when you read biographies of, of women who've served in prior generations, you really see how much has changed for the better. And I'm just going to give you a, a flavor of that here uh, today. Jean Kirkpatrick, raised in a small town in Oklahoma, uh, ducked out of an early stint in government to raise her three sons while she was competing her doctorate at Columbia. She was discovered in 1979, that's the year I came to this country from Ireland, uh, after Dick Allen, Ronald Reagan's foreign policy advisor in the presidential campaign, gave Reagan an essay that she had written in commentary, which you all probably are familiar with, called Dictatorships and Double Standards. Reagan, who had just announced that he was running for president, read the essay on a flight from Washington to Los Angeles and called Allen very excitedly when he got home. What you gave me to read was extraordinary, Reagan said. Who is this guy, Gene Kirkpatrick? <laughs> Kirkpatrick was almost always the only woman in the room at the UN and in Washington. During her four years uh, in New York at the UN, she was one of just three women, amb women ambassadors out of the then 157 UN member states, three out of 157. She served with uh, also a woman ambassador from Liberia and from the Seychelles. The Soviet Union, just to give you an indicator, has had actually 11 ambassadors in their mission. So you, you often, you know, like the United States has five. So you had 11, none, of, none a woman. Um, she later recalled how people kind of interacted with her or, or treated her. She said, quote, it rocked them. I think they just regarded me as a very odd creature, end quote. Now, the Washington glass ceiling she shattered is, in many ways, uh, just as important, if not more important. She was the first woman in history to have a seat at the table in the high-level debates. You know, now we'd call it the Principles Committee. Then they had another uh, name for it. But basically, your national security cabinet, the first woman ever. And I remember, again, I was new uh, to the United States, an immigrant with my, with my mother, my younger brother. But a photo that really stuck in my mind from when I was a kid. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> um, was this one. And, and seeing Kirkpatrick there among the suits at the center of the, of the shot. Now, um, soon, after, uh, uh, soon after she was chosen UN ambassador, a friend of hers reported that Secretary of State Alexander Haig had reacted to the news of her appointment by exclaiming, I don't know how anybody expects that I will work with that bitch. <laughs> Secretary Haig, who famously craved the diplomatic limelight himself, accused Kirkpatrick of being temperamental, sound familiar, mentally and emotionally incapable of thinking clearly, especially during the Falklands crisis when their relationship came uh, to a head. Even those who respected Kirkpatrick, of whom there were many at the time, treated her differently, I think it's fair to say. In the spring of 1983, Chief of Staff Mike Deaver told her, everyone notices you have influence with President Reagan. When Kirkpatrick shrugged, Deaver went on, no, 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 everyone notices. He always listens when you speak. He looks at you and his eyes light up. Maybe it's because you're a woman. Kirkpatrick shot back, maybe it's because he's interested in foreign policy. <laughs> um, President Clinton appointed Madeleine Albright to the UN ambassadorship less than a decade later. By this time, she was not the sole woman in the traditional cabinet photo. For Albright, 
also sitting behind the placard in New York that said United States of America had special resonance. She was a Czech uh, immigrant, but a, a refugee, her, her refugee family had come to this country, um, and she remains to this day is incredibly grateful to this country for welcoming her in, and very outspoken about now the curbs on uh, incoming refugee flow. Albright married young, three days after her college graduation, and took the long road, uh, 13 years to completing her doctorate at Georgetown, while she raised her three daughters. She was frustrated that the skills she was honing as a multitasking mother carried little weight in the professional world. As she would later put it, senior vice president for communications sounds so much more important than put out school newsletter. <laughs> um, Albright did not hold a full-time job until she was 39 years old. When I was nominated to become UN ambassador and I went to see Secretary Albright, she told me that when she had been at the UN, she had convened a group for women ambassadors. And then when she was there, again, there were more countries in the world as well than when Kirkpatrick had been there, there were 183 countries, and only seven of those countries were represented by women. So Albright branded her group the G7. <laughs> Not the group of seven, the girl seven. And they traded gossip, they shared family experiences, and they really, I think importantly, became a cross-regional lobby on behalf of women's issues, even managing to get two women judges onto the bench of the new UN War Crimes Tribunal, which was just being set up. Now, I had way more female company when I got to New York in 2013. I was one of 37 women permanent representatives out of 193 countries, again, more countries than in 93. But that's still just 20% uh, overall, which is quite similar, actually, to our own Congress, the, the, the ratio. And again, the UN tends to be reflective of how things are within national systems. Now, on the most powerful UN body, which is the 15-member UN Security Council, I had the chance in 2014 to serve with four other women. There were five of us, and we, the United States, Nigeria, Luxembourg, Jordan, and Lithuania. We were the largest female contingent on the council in the seven-decade history of the UN. And though we only accounted, we didn't all sit together, actually. This was, <laughs> this was a panel, but um, maybe we should have. Um, though we only accounted for a third of the membership on the premier UN body responsible for making international law, deciding on the use of force, sanctions, et cetera, the excitement around the UN was palpable in this period where we, where we had the chance to serve together. Young women would pull me aside in the restroom, in the ladies' restroom, uh, to say how proud they were to see five women duking it out in the usually uh, male Security Council chamber. And the longer I served, though, also, apart from how it looked and, and the, the signal that that sent, which I'll come back to, the longer I served, the more uh, evidence I saw of the functional value as well of, of this gender parity. Having more women on the council just simply put, changed the nature of our deliberations. We weren't perfect at listening to one another, but I think it's fair to say we listened to one another more. Uh, with more women colleagues on the council, we also talked more, as it happened, about sexual violence and about the importance of including women in peace processes from which they are so often shut out. Um, Nonetheless, even with us there, and we were a formidable uh, group, I mean, there's the character of the, the individuals involved uh, were very, very, very strong in, in each case. Um, um, but having, just even having that presence didn't, of course, stop our, some of our male colleagues from saying completely crazy things uh, behind closed doors. On several occasions, uh, male ambassadors questioned whether well-documented cases of rape as an atrocity in war had occurred, and just quote you from one of them, why would the soldiers have done this when they have their wives to come home to? One of my African colleagues asked, where is the proof? If these rapes really happened, any woman victim would want to talk about it. They wouldn't care if security forces were present. So I asked, this is the advantage again, at least being in the room where it happens, um, I asked, oh, are you speaking from your vast personal experience of having been raped and then being asked what happened while security forces affiliated with your rapist leered over you? Is that how you are an authority on this matter? Um, the Russian ambassador, 
memorably, it's become the stuff of legend uh, in the small circle that is New York, but uh, criticized the UN's Yemen envoy for spending too much of his precious time on the ground talking to women. Your job is to make peace, and that is a hard enough job, the Russian ambassador said. Why are you wasting your time having meetings with women who aren't even involved in the conflict? That's, that's an important point. Uh, so let's spend all our time with the men who are fueling the conflict and uh, won't stop. In each of these instances and many others, uh, the heads of the women ambassadors present and some of the uh, male ambassadors, of course, as well, would snap to attention. And each of us would fling our hand up in the air to seek the floor to challenge what had been said. Unfortunately, in 2016, the number of women ambassadors dwindled back down to one out of 15. There she is. That's me. Um, and uh, it remained that way until just a few weeks ago when Karen Pierce became the first woman in history to represent the United Kingdom uh, at the United Nations, joining now uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley. In my years in government, as I alluded to earlier, I developed a heightened appreciation for, for symbols. And, and one of the most moving photographs taken during the Obama presidency, right, was, was this one of Jacob Philadelphia. This was 2009 just tentatively reaching up to, to just to feel, to see, to be sure, could it really be the case that this African-American man with hair just like this little boy's was in fact President of the United States. So what we see matters hugely. Um, changes our, our sense of what's possible. And when I would sit in the open chamber of the Security Council uh, as the only woman permanent representative, I would often see the school tour groups that would come in to the UN in New York and uh, they're escorted into the viewing gallery. They sit there. They watch um, you know, 10, 15 minutes of the debate. And I just you find myself wondering, you know, what must these children think? Um, they look down at this famous horseshoe where world history has sometimes been made. And you know, is the ambition of these girls altered by the sense that, that there's one out of four, 15 people is you know, a woman at this table, and, and the boys? sense for both of what is normal, um, shaped, again, by that, that um, uh, picture. So needless to say, in the 21st century, it should not and should never have been seen as normal for women to have only one seat at that table or for any table. So I am working on a book about my experiences in government, provisionally titled The Education of an Idealist, uh, a title that will likely change, because why is it only idealists who get educated? I ask you. Um, but nonetheless, gives you a sense of what I'm trying to, to track. And um, Now, uh, but in part because of all that is going on around us now and the bravery of women across so many domains, I, I am asking myself questions that I haven't really asked before. Uh, you know, has my professional life been impacted uh, more by these issues than I, than I recognize? Was I? at times dismissed or underestimated because of my gender? Have I myself blocked out various dimensions of the problem and in so doing failed to do as much as I should have myself in the, the positions that I've had to, to combat this phenomenon? And how can I equip my, my young daughter to handle what lies ahead for her? Um, so I'm still wrestling with these personal questions and I don't have great answers yet, but I have uh, for the purposes of today, at least, you know, tried to distill kind of what are the lessons for now, um, you know, at least as, as I can offer them up. So here are a few uh, ideas, at least humbly put, tentatively put. But first, I think um, women have a wonderful opportunity and responsibility to have the backs of other women. I, I tried to use my perch at the UN to push for women's voices to be heard around the world. Um, uh, often I was unsuccessful, but at times uh, we were able to line the moons up in a way that I think mattered. Um, one example is that I launched a campaign um, called Hashtag Free the 20, uh, which was uh, aimed at securing the release of 20 women political prisoners around the world. These are voices of women that were being silenced in Egypt, Ethiopia, Venezuela, China, a whole bunch of countries. Here were the 20 women, and we would, uh, I would hang, uh, each day for 20 days, we hung a portrait of one of the women and profiled them and 
social media, and the, and the State Department, the White House got behind it, as did members of Congress. And I think thanks to a lot of advocacy, and particularly that by outside groups have nothing to do with the US government, but in the end, together, uh, 16 of the 20 prisoners we profiled uh, gained their freedom. Um, the other thing I did was, uh, and, and again, much of what I did was, was um, ineffective, but this really, the, the, what I'm about to describe, it felt like there was a power to it, but, but very, very um, you know, hard to know, uh, certainly in the short term. But just a simple thing that all of us have in our power to do today, which is just while traveling abroad as UN ambassador, just insisting on every one of my trips that I would just meet with young girls in, in difficult situations and just talk to them about their aspirations. And, and most of these girls, you can imagine, had never met um, a high-ranking uh, female official. In Mexico, I met with a group of underprivileged girls in a soccer league, played soccer with them. In Nigeria, I met with a group of schoolgirls from Chibuk, which many of you know from the news. Who, these are, were girls who had been captured by Boko Haram, but then mercifully uh, had escaped uh, in the early part of their captivity. In the war-ravaged uh, north of Sri Lanka, meeting with Buddhist and Muslim girls who were learning how to live together again. And in Israel and the Palestinian territories, sitting down with honor students who dreamed of becoming engineers, architects, and even a few politicians. Um, so I mean, the hurdles that these girls faced were unimaginable. But again, the ferocity of their determination and discipline um, left me and, and the members of my team completely blown away and inspired. We still have a huge amount of work to do in ensuring women and girls abroad and at home have the confidence to pursue the ambitions that they think up for themselves. And, and here, just I'll give you an American statistic that's quite jarring. Um, American men are both more likely to see themselves as qualified to run for political office and much more likely to receive encouragement from family and friends to do so. A pair of studies, one from 2001, one 2011, found that men were almost 60% more likely than women to describe themselves as very qualified to be a candidate, even though the men and women surveyed were both equally experienced in terms of fundraising, policy knowledge, et cetera. A follow-on report that focused on young people similarly found that female college students are less likely than their male peers to feel that they have what it takes to run for office. That's, uh, again, more recent. This self-doubt manifests itself in a whole bunch of very subtle ways. A fascinating survey, have you, oh, you can't actually see it, um, of Americans aged 15 to 24 was released just two weeks ago. And it confirmed what we have all been seeing. Young women distinguish themselves as much more politically engaged than their male counterparts in 2017. And that was on everything from volunteering to donating money to attending demonstrations. At the same time, a much higher percentage of women cited a lack of knowledge about the issues or a fear of undue criticism as explanations for why they decided not to be politically active. As teachers, parents, and mentors, we've got to somehow find a way to continue to narrow and close, in the end, this confidence gap. Second, if we want to make change, um, we who share a desire to see change must embrace politics in all of its messiness. Uh, I don't know, that's sort of the biggest realization I have on all national security issues and certainly on this issue, anything related to gender. There's really no obvious door number two. Um, politics, politics, politics. And here again, some good news. Emily's List, which for more than three decades has been tracking the number of women uh, who have come forward uh, to run for office. Um, uh, they, Emily's List, as you know, has existed for 32 years, and it helps recruit and uh, elect pro-choice women. Um, but it reported that in 2016, the 32-year-old record was shattered, that 920 women had come forward uh, seeking information about how to run for office. Now, in 2017, the year that just closed out, the 920 was... <laughs> looks like the 19th century, 22,000 women reached out. So it just gives you a sense, like that was the prior record, that, that, and that's captured in a lot of what we, we read about, of course, in terms of women's engagement. Between two th 2016 and now, the number of women running for congressional or statewide offices has doubled. 
And in those crucial races for control of the House, so far there are 389 women running, the most female candidates ever seeking to become a US representative. And women are not only running, they are winning. In Virginia, 11 of the 14 women candidates for the House of Delegates, backed by Emily's list, won their races, 11 out of 14. Many of these women were first for, for the Virginia House, the first Latina, the first Asian American, the first lesbian, and the first transgender woman. Signing ceremony looks a little different than often. Um, but we must acknowledge, of course, that change is slow and incremental gains never seem to be enough. At the current rate of progress, without knowing now the outcome of 2018, where so many more women are, are getting involved, but so putting that to one side, but it would, unless that makes a major difference, take another 75 years to achieve gender parity in Congress and 152 years um, for state governors. Now, that's not what it's going to take. Uh, it's going to take a lot less than that. But that's if we were to, to extrapolate on the basis of where we are now. Shelley Simmons, a name you might re remember from the news of the last uh, couple months, um, tied for her Virginia seat. And she lost then, if you can call it that, because of the random drawing to break the tie that went in her opponent's favor. And afterward, she said, I'm my usual angry, pissed off self about the situation. Next time, I'm not going to lose. Um, and it seems like it will take that kind of resilience and determination to accelerate those numbers and the pace of change. Third, I only have four, I think those of us who uh, have been fortunate enough to obtain um, high profile roles as women leaders, my own view is that we could afford to be more open uh, about the doubts and the challenges that we face. Uh, Madeleine Albright, I've, I've always really admired for, for doing this. Um, she has often talked about being the only woman at the table in policy debates and thinking, and these are her, her words, OK, well, I don't think I'll say that. It might sound stupid. And then some man says it, and everybody thinks it's completely brilliant. You are so mad at yourself for not saying something. Um, that's Madeleine. Across male-dominated fields, women experience many of the same dynamics, but we don't always seek each other out uh, to learn from one another. And you know, I know that while I never would have been the one to create this Wednesday group I told you about at the NSC, I'm so glad that one of my colleagues had the insight to do so. The busier one is, the less time one feels one has for such initiatives, but I think um, they offer consolation and inspiration at once. We women are often uh, the jugglers. If we happen to have kids, um, no amount of leaning in appears to have changed the fact that we are the ones likely to be orchestrating the carpool um, and making sure our kids brush their teeth properly. Sorry, I'm sure there are amazing male parents here. Uh, I'm, it doesn't apply. In my household, uh, the, the modernity has not yet struck um, on, on, the, on these matters. Um, He's, he's, not, he's out of town, so I can get, I get away with this. But feel free to bring it up the next time you see him at, at Harvard Law School. Um, some women uh, perform the miracle juggle. I mean, most women perform the miracle juggle without advertising it, um, somehow managing uh, their jobs or their home lives as if with their kind of left hands, making it look easy from the outside. I have been incredibly lucky to have a lot of support um, for my juggle, including my, my mother and my, my, my parents. But I've never found it easy, and have always, um, or at least since I've been in public life, advertised uh, those challenges um, for what they're worth. Um, the, the time I really started doing that was when I had uh, a grueling confirmation hearing because of what I had written as an activist and an academic. It was very difficult to go before the US Senate and then have to answer for everything I'd said and written my entire life. Um, so it was difficult, and the gavel sounded, finally. It was over. I prepared for it for weeks. Um, and my four-year-old son jumped into my arms. I, I know. Uh, and he's such a ham. He was like, hey, I've been waiting for this my whole life. Um, and a good few, you can't see it, but like basically a scrum of reporters came, and they started snapping this photo. And it was published in uh, a good few newspapers. Um, 
And I, you know, I, it's a lovely photo of my son, um, and I, it just captures my relief, I think, at uh, surviving my confirmation hearing. But what amazed me about this was I started getting notes from all over the country, and even some from around the world, just saying how heartened they were to see somebody uh, attempting a national security cabinet role with small children in tow. And again, I just didn't, that wasn't my orientation. I didn't think in those terms, and then began to be much more uh, public about some of the, the, the dimensions to, to my juggling. Um, so this meant speaking about the inelegance of my efforts uh, to work and mother at the same time. This was my approach, not one I recommend for everybody. So I might have mentioned publicly several times how I breastfed my daughter while on the phone with the UN Secretary General talking about a chemical weapons attack uh, in Syria. Uh, or the way in which, uh, in order to explain my absences to my boy Declan, I taught him more about Vladimir Putin and Crimea than is probably healthy for a seven-year-old. <laughs> um, but the point is, every woman has her own way of managing their very particular uh, juggle, and so too makes up her own mind, the same true with uh, working dads, of course, as well, about how transparent to be about that challenge. My conscious decision, particularly in the wake of the reaction I had to this photo, was to overshare, um, which may be a weakness of mine. Fourth and finally, even amid the cruelty uh, being perpetrated by our current president, um, and the desire many of us have to change the whole world at once, uh, I think figuring out how to be good with bite-sized contributions and doing what each of us can do, what is identifying and pursuing what is in each of our power to do. Um, it's about you know, what is one's specific difference, what is the specific difference each of us can make. Um, and you know, it is going to be millions of small contributions that ultimately produce the kind of equality uh, that we seek. And here, I, it was a Martin Luther King, I love Martin Luther King quotes, constantly been quoting them my whole life, but I had never seen this quote, but it's now my favorite Martin Luther King quote, um, be a bush if you can't be a tree, if you can't be a highway, just be a trail, if you can't be a sun, be a star, for it isn't by size that you win or fail, be the best at whatever you are. And here, inspired a little bit by a talk that Catherine Sicking gave on, on Tuesday, um, uh, I would point to the simple act even of voting, um, which all citizens uh, have it within their power to do. And, and focusing specifically on women, it is devastating to note that while women still generally vote more than men in the United States, female turnout in 2016 was down when compared to 2004, 2008, and 2012. Given the stakes and the consequences that we're living every day, that's something we you know, have got to remedy. Um, and that's with the chance to elect even the first woman president uh, in American history. We have to find a way to rally our family and friends, having worked so hard to secure for women a voice in American political life. Um, encouraging women to raise that voice and insist uh, that they be heard. Um, in addition, and this is just because I feel like every talk uh, that's in any way about politics or public policy needs to address this in some fashion, but I think you know, part, again, of our small contributions before we are able to make the, the, the big ones relates to political polarization. Um, you know, as it, speaking here directly to, to women, you know, if we are mothers, we are talking incessantly about our kids to other mothers and fathers. Now, in the Republic of Cambridge, it may be that we don't, there isn't a huge amount of diversity there, but in most communities, um, uh, it is still, there is, you know, more plurality in those communities than is reflected by our electoral maps. Um, and I think, Again, as all of us, as, as people um, who are parts of families, want our leaders to solve practical problems for our families. So here again, just we can all do better at, at trying to listen to one another and be prepared to change our minds, something that gets harder and harder, um, given uh, what is coming at us. Trying to reclaim this world of facts and truth and putting our minds to you know, the, the larger epistemological challenge of how we, we go about that. Um, and focusing on what unites us, which notwithstanding, again, the 
the, the group of people that appear to want to go in a different direction, you know, wanting security and dignity for our families and our communities um, it really does, it can unite the vast majority of people in this country. And, um, you know, in the spirit of talking about, you know, aspiring uh, to breaking down some of the echo chambers in our, in our country and our culture, I would note that this national reckoning that I've referred to and that is so much with us in so many spheres right now um, was kicked off by none other than Gretchen Carlson, a longtime Fox News anchor who for many years hosted Fox and Friends, Donald Trump's favorite TV show. And as a direct result of Carlson's bravery in coming forward with her stories of sexual harassment, Roger Ailes resigned as president of Fox. This started a domino effect that led to the dismissal of Bill O'Reilly and top network executives. And today, Gretchen Carlson is a major force behind pursuing bipartisan legislation uh, that is now pending before Congress, which would invalidate unfair mandatory arbitration clauses that allow employers to cover up patterns of abuse by preventing employees from taking cases of sexual harassment to court. I would like to close um, and really look forward to the discussion. Uh, these are difficult times, to say the least. Um, but America's history, I need that back. I need that back. Can I have that back? Thank you. Um, Amer America's history uh, is, of course, filled with, with di difficult times. And women have uh, always been among the first to rise. Um, at the risk, again, of pandering at Radcliffe, the historian Gerda Lerner once counseled, always asked, what did the women do while the men were doing what the textbook tells us what was, was important? <laughs> um, and here, just again, in the realm of inspiring historical tidbits, 4,500 women launched campaigns for office before the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. And somewhat amazingly, given the times, more than 3,000 won those races. And Susanna Salter, who was the first woman ever elected mayor in, this, in the US, was put on the ballot in Kansas by a group of men who thought it would be a hilarious joke until she won 2 thirds of the votes. <laughs> so we think we have it bad. Women were a driving force in the movement to abolish slavery and a century later in the civil rights movement. We remember the names, of course, of Rosa Parks and Fannie Lou Hamer, Sojourner Truth. But women whose names never appeared in bold print also helped carry these movements. Women like Alabama's Joanne Robinson, who mimeographed 35,000 leaflets the night of Rosa Parks' arrest to publicize the first bus boycott. And of course, when it came to fighting for equal pay, it was a woman, Lily Ledbetter, who never gave up even when the Supreme Court sided against her. She appealed all the way to President Obama, who signed the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act in 2009, helping restore protections for women against pay discrimination. It is clear that women and men must unite behind the cause of equality. Um, it has been a year since the incredible women's marches, and we've just had the anniversary marches. My favorite sign was one hoisted uh, by a middle-aged man. <laughs> I think that kind of says it all. Uh, not usually a sign guy, but geez. Uh, so influenced by sign guy, who I hope to meet someday, um, it does seem the right time to ask, what are each of us normally not that these times suddenly require us to be? And little girls like this one are counting on us to figure that out. So thank you. That's my daughter. Thank you. Is it time? Yeah. Hi. Please, Thank yeah, you. if you could just introduce yourself maybe and. Sure. My, my name is Tanya Bartevian. I'm a Harvard Radcliffe graduate, a concert pianist, and with interest in many disciplines. And I try to speak up in my hometown about issues, uh, irregularities, process matters, et cetera. Um, so. Um, I am going to also ask about a foreign policy question, which is the um, 
non-recognition of the Armenian genocide. I do happen to be Armenian, but pretend I'm Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Turkey, so I, I, I have made my own peace with the issue. But I am concerned. Um, I, I, I know that it can't be an easy matter in foreign policy because Turkey is a military ally and they don't want 1915 stuff recognized. But how, what do you think? Wouldn't it be better if genocides were all recognized so that... A, they don't repeat. B, we call them genocide as they happen today, like the Rohingya. Um, and maybe it explains more of what's going on in the Middle East today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think genocide should be recognized. I think when um, governments or people or institutions are put in a position where they have to contort and kind of you know, wiggle around and come up with euphemisms, I think they're in madness lies. And um, we, as your question, <laughs> you polite in, in the way you pose your question, but as your question suggests, we promised we were going to recognize the Armenian genocide, and we didn't. And if you ask me why, um, you know, fundamentally, the, the president initially, the right year to do it would have been 2009. We had promised on the campaign we'd just come off, rip the Band-Aid off, um, and just say to... President Erdogan, sorry, but, you know, I, I made this commitment. I keep my commitments. I mean, we were really motivated as an administration um, by the set of things that we had promised to do. Um, but there was, you might remember, back in 2009, a nascent normalization process between Armenia and Turkey. And the president was convinced that doing so would potentially set back that in the region reckoning among the part, uh, you know, between the parties. Um, to me, it, it seemed more like a ploy on the part of Turkey to get through April 24th, 2009, uh, the, our first Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day occasion where we should have recognized. Um, and I think that history bore that out, that it, it ended up being not um, a normalization process to which uh, there was real sincerity to make progress. Then the other occasion, then you, of course we could have done it any year, but I, just the way government works, the other bite at the apple was really on the 100th anniversary when Pope Francis recognized and um, many countries and parliaments around the world. And there, again, I'm, this isn't by way of excuse, but just to give you a sense of the context, we were just getting access to Turkish bases to, to fight against ISIS, and there was a fear that Erdogan, given his... Um, erratic uh, way of uh, dealing with, with everything and his anti-Americanism and so forth would just, would actually sooner have ISIS caliphate survive uh, than allow Americans to, to use these bases in the wake of um, the genocide recognition. So, you know, this is why they pay President Obama, or didn't really pay him the big bucks, but uh, uh, these are really tough calls, and I, but I, I think I come back to your, your first premise, it's just in general, it will serve you well over time if, if, you, um, if, if we as a government, if we as people, if we tell the truth. Yep. Uh, yes, hi. My, <clears throat> sorry, I have a sore throat. My name is Ann Eldridge, and uh, I wanted to ask a question um, about um, relationships between men and women in the diplomatic service and in national security in general. I happen to have a classmate class of 1957, uh, who is a retired diplomat, and she was married to a classmate who was also a diplomat and served, they both served in many areas of the world, and actually her career starting out in the 1960s doing this uh, is just replete with the kinds of challenges that you described, including being told that, you know, well, he has this position, we thought you were coming along to be a secretary. Um, but I happened to be reading her memoir, which just came out this year, just at the time that Vice President Pence was talking about how um, it is impossible to get into the elevator with a woman who is not mother. Um, and um, the situations that you describe in which men so vastly outnumber women and women have to face situations where they will be the only woman mm -hmm. in, a, in a context. Um, and then adding on to that the uneasiness that is now pervading 
the whole question of male-female relationships. What if I say this? What if I do that? I, I just wonder if you could comment on strategies that can address those kinds of challenges. Um, I, you know, I don't. Your, it's, your answer is probably, uh, and the answer people here would be better than mine. Maybe people have reflected on this more. I mean, you know, I think the sensitization by virtue of the the public conversation is already a step, and I think that you know right now, if you take just one institution, which is where the diplomatic corps lives, it would have been great if Secretary Tillerson, as part of this conversation, you know, had come out. He's so focused on the State Department and the building and the positions and the Foreign Service, but to make this, um, you know, a uh, a feature of that which I think is way too inward looking. I think he's way too inward looking generally. I wish he'd tell us what wars he wants to end um, and problems he wants to solve in the world. But since he's not that guy, uh, at least if he's going to deal with bureaucracy and make that his passion, you know, this is something that you, know, you can deal with incentives and disincentives and structures and airings. And, but you know, it's very hard to do that when Donald Trump is your president. And so that's why. You know, when it comes to at least the diplomatic world, even though it feels like you can have a conversation hived off from politics, it's about getting rid of people who aren't um, dedicated to figuring out how to how to how to manage this issue. And and um, so it you know it really is about uh, and I and I think you know there've been interesting writings. Jake Sullivan, who was um, Secretary Clinton's sort of policy guy in the, in the campaign is one of the most impressive people I met in my eight years in government. He came out um, uh, in the in the wake of the, the you know some of the, the kinds of disclosures that I uh, referenced today, and you know just talked about himself. Now I would see him as you know in the in the upper one percent of one percent of enlightened progressive. Um, you know, men that I came across in, in government, and there are many, but, but I mean, really top tier. And yet he was the one, he, he writes a long piece saying, here are all the ways in which I failed. Because it isn't enough just to be, you know, kind of progressive and then neutral when that, when that culture, which is so subtle and, and, you know, hard to break through in, um, exists around me. And so here, here's a, a list of the kinds of things I wish I had done as a progressive guy while I was in a position of power. He was Secretary Clinton's deputy chief of staff and then you know, was on the campaign. Um, so I refer you to that article. I mean, I, I think we have to change our leadership. And then our leadership needs to, to find a way to be more proactive. But one of the reasons I mentioned all the feeder information about think tanks and media and uh, panels and you know, that in, in, my, in this world of diplomacy, it really would make a difference if if we started having an equal number of people doing national security PhDs at the Kennedy School, and, um, and if we started also uh, internalizing in our, um, in our hiring you know, the kinds of different decisions women have to make at different parts in their career, and then make it easier for them to, to hop back in you know, if they've taken time out, let's say, to, to you know, uh, have a baby or something. Anyway, so there's a lot one can say, but. Um, but I think the, f the first thing we have to do is just it's back to politics, unfortunately. <laughs> Jay Gleason, uh, you, you're right that it would be nice if uh, Secretary Tillerson would uh, tell us how he wants to end the war in Libya, which uh, uh, Barack Obama has called the worst mistake of his presidency. You and Susan Rice and uh, the woman that you once referred to as a monster, Hillary Clinton, were leading advocates for that assault on Libya. Whereas at the same time, men in the cabinet like uh, Bob Gates and Tom Donilon and John Brennan were very much reluctant to take on that type of uh, intervention. So I can't help but wonder whether women are becoming uh, worse uh, warmongers and uh, cold-blooded killers than men are. Um, well, the number of factual inaccuracies that are uh, implicit or, or that were stated in your question do make me question whether you were in the room with all this vivid detail about who was on what side, because um, much of what's been written is inaccurate. Um, but let me talk about the intervention in Libya, which seems to be the, if I gather, the, the focus of your question. So in Libya, we had a circumstance that we were confronted with, which is that you had people who had risen up against uh, a dictator who was threatening to uh, hunt the people down like cockroaches 
who had turned its sights on Benghazi, which was uh, where the revolution had started and where tens of thousands of peaceful protesters were gathering every night in the, in the main square. The Arab League called, uh, had a meeting, an unprecedented meeting, where it expelled Libya from the Arab League and called for the world, the international community, to use all necessary means to protect civilians. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the British and the French proposed a no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. Gaddafi, I don't need, we don't need the... Uh, Gaddafi um, wasn't using his planes to carry out atrocities. All the evidence we had was that it was his militia on the ground who were hunting people down. And a no-fly zone basically would not be effective. So we went to the United Nations, which uh, other than 9-11, uh, basically had not authorized the use of force to protect civilians in more than two decades. And amazingly, the UN Security Council, the arbiter of international law, authorizes the use of all necessary measures to protect civilians, partly because they knew what Gaddafi was capable of and what he was explicitly stating he was going to do. So the president then uh, joined with a coalition of countries in order to carry out the intervention called for by the Arab League, by the UN Security Council, and by the Libyan resistance. As it happened, um, in the wake of the intervention, one of the things that the same people who've been calling for intervention were absolutely adamant about was no foreign presence, no foreign troops, no foreign police, no nothing. And in the wake of what was initially a very beautiful uh, time uh, where independent media flowered, civil society, women's organizations, and the kind of scrum of politics uh, turned very tribal, very messy, and with a division, a profound division within the society between Islamists and a more secular model. And Libya is in a terrible state today. And, and people are suffering um, uh, you know, the consequences of, of what amounts to a civil war, kind of low-grade civil war, with ISIS also now with a foothold. I think the challenge, and I'm you know, reckoning with this along with everything else, is knowing what we knew on the front end. You know, all we knew was what we knew. And, and we knew also, I, I don't, I, there are other people in line also who are going to want to speak, but uh, you know, in the wake of uh, 800,000 people getting killed in Rwanda, given how explicit Gaddafi was, and given what I really do believe to be the case, which is, had we not, I, I, what you would have, I believe, is the massacre, which would have been pretty ugly, but no one will know, like it's That's counterfactual, right. I have no idea how bad it would have been, maybe it would have been better than Gaddafi himself was saying he wanted to make it, and you would not have Libya of the pre-revolution Libya. It's not like you'd have a stable Libya today. Look at Syria. There's an example of no intervention. And, and is, is that a stable place where- All kinds where of intervention kinds in of Syria. Division? I'm sorry? There's all kinds of intervention in Syria, direct and proxy. In the UNSC, 1973 did not call for regime change. You can't cite anywhere where it said regime change. The oh, AU, the, 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 the okay. AU the, and the I Arab did, League did not call for regime change. We're good, all right. Thanks for coming. Hope you had enjoyed it. Hi, I'm Robert Cooper. Um, I love that photo of all the uh, male secretaries general of the UN. I wonder if you had any comment on the last selection process where there were several qualified women candidates. My personal favorite, since I'm from New Zealand, would, be, would have been Helen Clark, but there were several candidates. I yeah. wonder if you have any insights on that process. I have big insights because um, the United States, uh, fortunately for the United States, gets to be very central to it. And, you know, within that process, the 15 members of the Security Council choose the, the successor to Ban Ki-moon, chose the successor to Ban Ki-moon. Um, and because the five permanent members have a veto, well, ultimately, the, the, the United States has more than one fifteenth, uh, probably, of, of influence in all of this. Um, so this process, for the very first time, was public and transparent, and for the first time, the candidates for Secretary General had to perform and answer questions before the broader membership of the General Assembly, which I will say I did not think would, would necessarily, um, I thought it was the right thing to do, of course, in terms of legitimacy and broader ownership, but I, I didn't necessarily think it would produce a better outcome. I thought there'd be a fair amount of grandstanding and, you know, um, but it really was, it really changed the dynamic and it meant that among the, and I forget now, I think it was you know, 11 candidates we had, um, uh, more women competed this time, I think uh, five or six women competed, 
uh, than all the prior races for all the other secretary generalship combined. <laughs> so you know, that was the other thing about making it public and having an emphasis on having a woman, woman secretary general. There was a group of countries that was constituted called the Friends of a Woman Secretary General. Um, and you know, really banging the drum about the importance of having a lot of women candidates and, and with the hope that we would, we the 15 and, and specifically the five permanent would end up with uh, a woman secretary general. So these public debates meant that each of these candidates, including Helen Clark, everybody performed. And weirdly, countries as diverse as like Saudi Arabia, you know, France, Togo, uh, Thailand, they all came out of those sessions believing that Guterres was heads and shoulders, or heads and tails, however you say it, uh, above the rest in terms of his qualification. Now, he's a former prime minister and um, former head of the UN Refugee Agency. But one of, the most, one of the interesting things was the main thing he had to answer for, like he was very explicit about it, he's like, I'm not a woman. And I think, basically, if, it weren't, if I weren't running, I would think that there should be a woman secretary general. Um, but here's what I've done for women throughout my career. And half his cabinet when he was prime minister was, was women, all of the senior, you know, not all, um, you know, I think it was a, a slim majority of his senior appointments when he was head of the refugee agency were women. So he had an account, uh, not just on appointments, but also on policies about what he had done for women. And, uh, you know, in the end, while the United States had, there were more than one candidate that we would have supported as secretary general, Guterres was the only one that we could get all five of those countries to agree upon. So a couple of the other women, you know, and I, I'm not going to out my, my colleagues on the Security Council, but a couple of the other women who we thought were very compelling um, were voted against by permanent members, which basically sowed their doom. Now, you could say, well, is, does this mean only the guys are going to be the consensus candidates? Because as guys, as I was one of 15, right, as guys casting the ballots. I, I, don't, I think in this case, um, you know, what, what shocked me is that Russia was prepared to live with Guterres, like somebody who had a record of pushing for human rights and women's rights, very, just a very progressive politician. Um, but, you know, j the, the fact that we actually had the broader pool and it, it felt like a level, I mean, it, it, you know, given the, what, the record I've described, this is hard to say, but it felt like people were being judged on the basis of how they, for instance, answered questions about the Libya intervention or answered questions about, you know, they weren't asked about the Armenian genocide, but, you know, you know that people had to perform and show their capabilities and, and lay out a program for what they were going to do. And it has to be said, um, Guterres is the one now who's going to, the Secretary General is the one who's going to have to deal with this guard, the Guardian expose and all the allegations of abuse and harassment. But he has also just announced that for the first time, uh, the senior appointments within the UN are completely 50 50. I think it's, where's Adam? Is it 50 50 or a little more? Yeah. Ba basically, even, even a majority now of women. And that, you know, Ban Ki moon was very outspoken on these issues, but if you look at the gap between the words and the actual appointments, um, there's, a, there's a big gap. So that's an example of a campaign promise that Guterres has already kept within a year of, uh, of arriving in the job. Hi, first off, I think it's an honor. I didn't think I'd ever be asking you a question. I admire you so much. So oh, my question, um, I just want to say that, and I, I, I've read your, um, your first book. Um, during my time in undergrad, I focused a lot on the Syrian crisis. But my question is about Syria, specifically um, President Assad, who is a war criminal. Um, my question is, will we ever be able to hold him accountable for these attacks? And there's now recent reports that there's other chemical attacks happening in eastern, Get, um, is it Ghouta? Um, those questions that, um, so really my question there is, Will there ever be a solution there? This, this conflict continues to happen, and we're talking about fighting ISIL, but you will not ultimately, in my opinion, defeat ISIL until you solve the Assad problem. So that's my question. Thank you. But it's so, such an honor to be here, so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Um, so let me, say, let me take your question, though, in, in two parts, because the first question was on Assad's personal accountability, and then the second, more the kind of structural question about wither the regime and, and um, so first on accountability, I mean right now he's operating with a sense of, and has been for uh, some time, operating with a sense of great impunity. Um, you know, fundamentally the economic sanctions that have been put in place, the, the tools in the toolbox that are about delegitimation and, and stigma, 
those just, you know, those have had no impact on him. Now, whether military force, uh, you know, taking to heart the point that the earlier question uh, addressed, which is you know, military force is a very un uncertain tool and you can't deal with these underlying fissures and cleavages in the society. So whether that would have made a difference, um, we don't know. And that's, again, something I'm going to have to grapple with uh, in, in the book that I'm writing and, and President Obama himself is grappling with in the memoir that he's writing. Um, but, you know, we tried, uh, I, I tried when I was ambassador to bring an international criminal court referral to the Security Council because that's, you know, when, since Assad's not going to refer himself um, and because Syria is not a state party, the court has no jurisdiction to, to say, hey, there's a guy running a country who's killing his people and gassing his people. So I tried that and Russia vetoed it, one of, uh, you know, a half dozen vetoes that Russia extended on Syria while I was at the Security Council. Um, and so it's tempting in the wake of that to think, you know, he's got Russia and Iran behind him. He's winning on the battlefield. Um, military force is not going to be employed, which is the one maybe coercive tool that hasn't been tried. Maybe it could make a difference. Um, and so this guy is like, you know, uh, whatever, home free. But I just, history, uh, there's not a lot of history that cuts in that direction. <laughs> Um, which isn't to say that tomorrow, you know, there's going to be some big of turn of fortune for him. But, you know, I, I, my first career, as I, I mentioned, was in the Balkans. And if you had told me when I left to come here to go to law school here that Slobodan Milosevic would end up imprisoned by the International Criminal uh, Tribunal for Yugoslavia or Rako Mladic, who just seemed invulnerable in, in very similar ways, and again, very different set of circumstances. NATO did get involved on the ground in Yugoslavia. That made a big difference. But um, you know, the, the, what tends to happen, even in countries where you don't have something like you had in the Balkans, is just the, the infighting uh, and the rivalries within the administration itself, combined with what we have now, which we didn't have initially back then, which is the documentation and the preservation of evidence means that it is you know, less likely to be a foreign plucking or imposition of something and more likely to be some kind of internal fissure at some point. But that's not very satisfying to people who are, have been victims. 400, 500,000 people have been killed, uh, it looks like, in, in Syria. As you say, the gas attacks, this genie out, out of the bottle you know, that we thought uh, was you know, squarely sealed in there you know, from, from the time of Saddam Hussein. Um, and so the, so the larger question, before one could even imagine this infighting or, or Assad meeting his political demise and then potentially getting extradited to face justice, um, is the question of a political solution to what's happening in Syria. And you know, Liz mentioned the final year of this movie um, that has just come out about Obama's last year, where. Obama and, and his team granted almost full access, basically, to a team of filmmakers. And one of the things that's um, captured in the film, it's kind of the heart of the film, is Syria. And the efforts that Secretary Kerry made are, are it, it, because it only captures the final year, it only shows him in the final year to get Russia, Iran, the Europeans, the Arabs, you know, the, the, the Gulf Arabs, everybody under the same tent to try to put enough pressure on the opposition and on the regime. And when you see this film, I mean, they're, 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 if, if nothing else, it'll just make you love John Kerry. It, it, you see him you know, at times like staggering up the stairs, just so exhausted because he's been going from a Yemen meeting to a Paris climate meeting, Cuba normalization, you know, Syria. And, and again, it's A for effort, but none of us, like, the, we didn't get the results that we, that we wanted. And yet, the one way I know we will not have a solution for Syria is for none of that effort to occur. And that's the world we're in now where, you know, the way international diplomacy works for now before China begins to flex its muscles as it will at some point in these areas, but it's like a pickup, it's like pickup basketball. You know, someone is picking people and, and pulling them into the tent and putting forward uh, political agreements. We have a military, a tactical approach to defeating ISIS, as you said, we have nothing as the United States or the broader international community aimed at getting at the underlying causes of ISIS. And that just has to change. And I'm hopeful, the only hope I have is that our military, which has performed you know, so ably in, in you know, achieving this very important tactical victory of ending the caliphate, in my experience, it, and the same chairman of the Joint Staff 
today was the one that we had, Joe Dunford, who's superb. But in my experience in the Situation Room, whether on Libya or Syria or anything else, it's the military saying, where's the governance? How are we going to deal with the underlying causes of why people went into ISIS in the first place? Because they know it's just whack-a-mole with military force alone. And so maybe that's the, the tail will wag the dog eventually, and we'll start to get some diplomacy out of this administration. No problem. Yeah, maybe we'll t I'll take all your questions, right, and I'll write down my yes-no answers. <laughs> um, hi, Liam DeClivelo, um, aspiring political organizer and undergraduate student here at the Harvard Extension School. Um, in your presentation, you talked about uh, this uh, surge in candidates, especially women candidates who are now running for office. And obviously, in those elections, um, foreign policy is enormously, an enormously complex issue that has uh, huge impacts on the way that people vote. So, based on your experience, what is your advice to this new slew of candidates about how to talk about foreign policy on the campaign trail? And number two, do you have any plans to join those ranks of candidates as one yourself, potentially in the future? I did until that guy like scared me off. I was, I, I thought I... No. My name is Liriani. Uh, I'm a woman in tech. Um, and the work that you're doing in terms of uh, emphasizing the importance of women uh, in various roles is super critical. Um, you've been personally a great role model for me, whether you meant it or not, so it's, it's great to be here. Uh, my question for you is about the comment you made at the end regarding truth and uh, facts, which has been such a challenge for us. I do think it's the biggest risk for democracy for us. What are your thoughts regarding the real responsibility that tech companies have, and what's the role of government in that? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. My name is Guy. I'm a genocide survivor from Darfur. Uh, before coming to America, I lived in Israel also for five years, and then I'm um, currently an asylum seeker in the United States. Um, thank you for your magnificent contribution to the, uh, this global society. Um, my question is, uh, America has contributed to the, uh, to the world so much, but we still have a problem. Uh, I have some classmates that I ask, and their thought on America's contribution to the global society makes them a little bit uncomfortable because they feel like they're giving so much. Um, what is the better way that we can uh, do and stop all these crises that are happening in, uh, you know, outside America? And uh, also, where America stands today in the, uh, the crisis that are happening in Libya, the slave trade and uh, you know torture that is happening. I don't know if you saw it. Like yesterday was uh, on the news. Um, I don't want to take too much time, but for the also like uh, the international community, the uh, international criminal court, the ICC has issued warrant for arrest to uh, to arrest Al Bashir, the president of Sudan. But these guys are still moving uh, you know, from country to country. Uh, who is responsible in implementing the, 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 the court order of the ICC? Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Hans Schadl. I teach in the political science department at Yonsei University in Seoul, South Korea, but New England's my home, so it's really nice to see you here in person. Um, I followed your career trajectory back in the early 1990s. I was working as a news reporter locally at the time here in Massachusetts, and it was really something to see your dispatches in the Boston Globe during the Bosnian war and, of course, everything that's followed. Um, one of my big frustrations in international relations is that we talk so much about balance of power, and understandably so, but we give correspondingly little airtime to the idea of balancing responsibility. So I'm wondering, in your years in government, and especially at the United Nations in the last few years, did you come away from that time with any new insights that could inspire us a little bit about how we might think more comprehensively, maybe holistically, about how to manage responsibilities on issues, global warming, migrants, refugees. We could, of course, talk about R2P and the difficulty in rehabilitating that concept mm -hmm. after Libya. I mean, IR now is so much bigger than just diplomacy or foreign ministries. We have 
corporations, look at Davos this week, NGOs, schools and universities, churches, everyday citizens on Twitter. And there's so much out there, and I feel as if there's a lot of work in the field that's still ahead of us in terms of consolidating our thinking about how we can solve problems more effectively that transcend nation states. And of course, the UN is our, it's the best venue we've got, but it only goes so far. So any thoughts on that would be really great. Great, thank you. Great, okay. Um, wonderful, thank you all, and th thanks for staying through all of this. Um, but that's, it's okay if it's leave too. <laughs> um, so, um, so first for the aspiring political organizer, Liam, I think you said your name was. Um, I, I, we learned yesterday at Radcliffe, uh, through, or two days ago at Radcliffe, that um, only 24% of eligible Harvard students had voted in the midterm election in 2014. So just... Aspiring political organizer, there's a task for you. Let, let, like, why don't we all chip in and figure out how we can get that up um, just way, way higher um, as something we can do in the here and now. Um, but your question was about how to talk about foreign policy. And I guess I would acknowledge you know, that, that we, have, we, the Obama administration, did not crack that code, it's fair to say. Um, the fact that we now have not only the Trump base with America first and this kind of um, you know, discredited political ideology that has lived within our political ecosystem for you know, more than 100 a, a years, but the fact that that is now governing um, and that we're pulling out of the kinds of things that you know, put, put like my worldview to one side, but just as a matter of pragmatism, you know, are needed, uh, whether on climate or on terrorism, um, alienating our allies or insulting our allies and, and thus, you know, really jeopardizing our ability to call on them when we need them, whether in the context of an international framework or even just bilaterally. So, you know, the fact that it's on the left and the right, and I'm not a believer in false equivalence because only one party is governing and doing these things, but, you know, the the... Um, left wing of the Democratic Party is not very enthusiastic about, it, or some of them anyway, are not very enthusiastic about the kinds of investments in uh, our national security, whether in the form of our military or our diplomacy or in terms of international engagements. And so this, these wings are very different and you know, one has a much more inclusive uh, model and doesn't have the, the xenophobia and the racism or any of the, that stuff. But in terms of the belief of the balance between the domestic enterprise and all that is left to be done here at home and what we do abroad, um, uh, there, there ends up being an overlap at times in, in prescriptions. So that, that worries me a lot. And on communications, you know, I've, I've talked to some of my favorite members of Congress about this. Um, you know, we have to find a way to talk about climate that feels relevant to people's lives here. And it won't be by talking about the Paris Agreement. And, um, you know, uh, some people ask me sometimes, like, you know, about my book, and is there, like, a thesis undergirding it? And the only thing I can tell you is I will not, the words liberal international order will not appear in my book. Like, I, I aspire in telling stories to, to reach people, you know, yes, that is, that is my, you know, unconcealed worldview is that we have to invest in our common security and our common humanity. But, I've got to find a way, and we've got to find a way to communicate that in a manner that's accessible beyond, you know, our like-minded uh, cohort. So, I don't have a great answer, but I, but I think you're, this question of how to, what the, what the, uh, communicate, how to talk about foreign policy, is really important. And we went through this on Ebola. You know, one thing President Obama did, which I really admired at the time, um, but I think has to be supplemented, is. You know, people were in full-on panic in this country about Ebola. You remember when patient Duncan died in Texas and some of the nurses got infected? And the polling was horrific, I mean, even in Democratic districts of people uh, wanting to close our doors and not even let health workers come back into this country or to quarantine them when they came back in. And this was at a time where more Americans had married Kardashians than had died of Ebola, right? Like it was, 
And so President Obama didn't say what I just said, which would, you know, of course you're not going to, you, you know, uh, you know, I went to the West Africa in the middle of the Ebola crisis. I was scared. I mean, you know, fear is okay. like it's a legitimate thing that one can feel. Um, but how to how to meet people where they are and kind of, you know, if you just on, whether on terrorism, refugees, Ebola, climate, if you just cite statistics for people. We're, you know, a lot of people, that's good enough. But there's uh, a group that aren't the Trump base, but of people who can be convinced, but whom we have not brought into the fold, for whom statistics and, and just facts aren't meeting them viscerally where they are when they are feeling those fears, which of course are stoked then by people who shouldn't be, who should know better. Um, in terms of tech companies, let me, let me just uh, acknowledge, I think, the importance of, of the question. In, in the following way, you know, people ask us about the Russia interference, which I'm surprised we haven't been asked about, um, and with good reason. And they ask, should we have done more? And you know, should Obama have come out and not just the intelligence agencies before the election and all the rest? And we're all going to be asking ourselves questions about what we might have done differently. But one thing I just want to convey is um, when we, we so cyber security and cyber threats by foreign nations is something that we have developed over the last decade plus, an infrastructure within the US national security establishment to deal with. Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, Defense Department Intelligence in terms of who's doing what. Um, when it comes to fake news and ad buys and your, the decentralized world of your existence and, and other citizens' existence, whether here or anywhere else, um, there's no obvious government lever and, and that's why this conversation that's happening in Silicon Valley is unsatisfying as I, I have found it up to this point, really is a conversation that should have been happening four or five years ago. And we should have done everything in our power. We should have done more to try to catalyze that conversation. Um, but it, it, fundamentally, it's going to be on that community of people to, to make things happen. And then um, I, I just merged the last two questions because uh, Guy's question was, um, you know, on how to, how to stop crises and, and share burdens better. And then the other was on balance of responsibility, which I think also is another version of, of burden sharing. Part of the answer to the first question about how you sell foreign policy in a broader way will entail being able to better describe what the international order is buying us. And Donald Trump has had this worldview throughout his life. He has not changed at all. He feels like we are getting ripped off. And he has found something, again, in his base, but also in others who have supported him and now may have maybe have melted away. But you know, we need to show, for instance, like in my world of UN peacekeeping, everybody focuses on the fact that it's a $8.5 billion budget for UN peacekeepers, 100,000 UN peacekeepers in the world. And we pay 28% of that. They don't focus on the fact that 72% is paid for by other countries. And moreover, the troops who actually are peacekeepers, who are risking their lives and dying at record rates, almost never come from the United States. We have a tiny uh, percentage of that. Climate, I think we made good headway. Um, but responsibility is something you hear a lot from the biggest emitters, from China and India. And their uh, conception of responsibility is historical, which is really important. If you're them, you're like, wait a minute, how come we just start caring about climate when we're now needing coal in order to develop and, and deal with our growing populations? And I think what we succeeded in doing partly by leveraging the relationships that Obama had built with Xi and with Modi, is for the first time now we have a, a language about responsibility that is lateral and in the present about emissions as a, you know, and being what dictates your responsibility. But we still have to acknowledge the historical and the dis disparities and so forth there. So I think a lot of creative thinking, thinking needs to be done, and, and the questions that emphasize language and framing are right because we, we have to do better. Uh, if, if we are going to um, go forward and actually be able to execute a worldview that is rooted in a sense that we are connected and that it is in our interests also to look out for others, whether at home or abroad, we're going to have to sell that. Thank you. Yeah.